computer. Okay, we are now recording, so please don't swear too much. And um, <laughs> there's my alarm going off. It's to oh, stop it. And it's um, so guess what? We are now having our 10th PEP Zoom monthly luncheon. Do you believe it's been 10 months Yay! that we've been doing Zoom? Wow. Unbelievable. And we've got a we've got a great speaker today. I just an outstanding oh, speaker there that is. all of you have heard before. And uh, I worked with with uh, the, our speaker um, uh, at LA Biomed. He's a little, you know, he comes from a place where they talk funny. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, you know, they call elevators lifts. And uh, a bonnet is, that you? is is a hood on a car. <laughs> and a pram is a baby stroller. Who calls a baby stroller a pram? And <laughs> you know, of course, what bee's knees are because say, is that you? we're all old. <laughs> this is the best one. Bob's your uncle. That means uh, you have it made. So we have a Bob's Your Uncle speaker today, and he's really great. And Jackie will formally introduce him in a little bit. Uh, but I hope hope you all literally are staying healthy and are getting your vaccine shots. Has everyone gotten both shots? Raise your hand. Yep. yep. Okay, you can take your masks off. <laughs> oh, they are off. Whoops, okay. Uh, before we go any further, like I do every month, because it's very important, I want to thank your board of directors for keeping PEP alive. You know, it's your board of directors that uh, does the, the writes the newsletter, prints the newsletter, collates the newsletter, stuffs it in envelope. It's your board of directors that runs the website. Uh, does all that, does uh, all the, the, the notices to everybody, um, uh, puts together the Zoom lunches and so much more. It's your board that is keeping PEP alive during these tough 10 months until we can have a place where we can see each other face to face. So please give a round of applause to your board of directors. They really deserve it. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. No, I'm on. And if you, I want to remind everybody, if you have any questions or complaints or suggestions, don't hesitate to contact any board member and we'd be glad to listen to your uh, suggestions or complaints. Our speaker today uh, will be speaking until 1215 and then we'll have a, uh, about 1215 and then we'll have a Q&A. And while he's speaking, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mute everybody. This my favorite thing I get to do is mute everybody. I really love that. But before we get into the speaker introductions, our beloved Jackie has some very important news to share. Jackie, it's all yours. I'm not pregnant. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I, my eggs are stale. Uh, I just wanted to uh, announce that I retired. My oh, last day, uh. my last day will be at the end of the month. Oh. Uh, it's good. I want you all to be happy for me because yes. I'm excited too. I want to volunteer at different places and help different organizations. Oh. And my first organization I really want to help out is the Pet Pioneers. So I won't work for the hospital, but I'll still work for you. Oh, that makes sense. Oh. Okay. So it's a win-win, guys. It's a win-win because I'm still going to do my IPS support group because I don't get paid for any of these things anyway. I volunteer. So I will do pep lunch and still. I still will do um, the IPS support group. I will support you guys in any way. I hope to get on the phone committee so that I can call people about the luncheon and maybe Dr. Rossiter can find something for me to do over there. But anyway, um, Oh. Be happy for me because I'm happy. Oh. I'm, I'm happy for this transition that I'm doing. I'm 63. Um, You're young. And I have been with the hospital for 41 years. Oh, wow. Uh, so wow. I, <laughs> wow. 
I think Dr. Rossiter was still in diapers when I started, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm saying is um, this is a really great, great transition for my family and for me. And I think I could serve you guys better not being um, so grumpy at you with the work that I'm doing at work and da, 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 da. But I have some things up my sleeve and I'm hoping that um, we can join other people in uniting in making PEP even bigger and stronger and more productive than we've been. And I can focus more on PEP, not having to clock in every day and do my work and da, 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 da. Don't get me wrong. I loved what I did for the 40 years. Um, it's time. But it's time. It's time. And so um, if I had a class to say, down the hatchet tequila is my my <laughs> all right okay <laughs> my devil so I, i'm taking a shot there and um so thank you for this beautiful journey that i've been on with all of you uh -huh. and i think that um things are just going to get better okay so uh -huh. um, i'll still be at the luncheon because again i'm just a person that was invited to a luncheon and i'll be there i will still be at the ipf support group and I will still try to look for guest speakers for you. So I'm not leaving you guys in the dark at all. I just don't work for the hospital. As of May 1, I'm, I'm free. Jackie, wow. I'm, I'm now you, Yeah, now you can go yeah. tramping with us. I can go camping, I can go fishing, yeah. Yeah. and I can spend more time with the tortoises. Ja Jackie, <laughs> on, on behalf of every one of the PEP members that are here today and those that <laughs> That, that have gone up to heaven. Uh, uh, I want to thank you for all your mm -hmm. years of love and dedication. No one, no one has worked with Pep longer than Jackie. Ja Jackie was no. there from day one and she has seen this organization grow into what it is today. And it's partly, it, and hugely due to Jackie's love and support and all the help she gave at, at, at exercise and classes. And, and you know the love that Jackie has for this organization. It is, it is incredible. And we, owe, every one of us owe so much to Jackie. No, and no. we're so yes. happy, Jackie, that you're retiring because you're, you're in, entering into a new phase of your life and you're gonna have such a ball and we're so excited about you continuing your relationship with Pep. And I had a long yeah. meeting with Jackie yesterday and there are lots of cool things that Jackie's got up her sleeve. So like I was saying earlier, just sit tight. But Jackie <laughs> is gonna stay part of Pep no matter what. So no matter what, Jackie, I will be with you to the very end. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. Jack, Jackie, if you want to introduce. Uh, yes, our, enough about me. Let's get started. Our, our with guest speaker. Party. I'll turn it over to you to introduce our guest speaker. Thank you. Okay. Um, this isn't my last speech. So <laughs> I'd like to welcome Dr. Harry Rossiter from the Lindquist Institute at Harvard UCLA Medical Center. He's, he spoke to us many, many times. And we're, he's a very busy man. So I'm pleased that he's taken time out of his incredibly busy schedule to join us today to talk about research. So Dr. Rossiter, take it away. Uh, thanks so much, Jackie. It's so great to see all the, all the faces that I recognize, a couple that I don't, which is, which is wonderful. And, and you know, I just wanna join in everyone else in saying, to you, Jackie, that this, oh. the PEP and, and the rehab at Little Company it wouldn't be the same without you. Um, well, you're not going from PEP, so it will be the same. No, You'll still no. be there. <laughs> um, but, you know, you, you just added so much, and uh, we really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank so you, much. everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me, oh, can somebody allow me share to share the my screen? screen? Yeah. Uh, Who's yes. Got uh, going to share the screen. Yep, yep. I'm, I'm going on it. Multiple participants. That's the one. We're in here. Yeah, you, you should. Uh... Huh? We can here we go. I have the power. Here we go. Here we go. You see, you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Great. Um, when when it's not when when I'm sharing the screen like that, I can't see everybody's faces, which is you know such a shame. But. Uh, um, 
if you want need to ask a question, you just have to shout, <laughs> or we can wait for the end. Yeah, but I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, probably. Oh, you're gonna mute everyone, so you can shout as much as you like. And I won't hear you. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so just for um, uh, so for the, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Harry Rossiter. I'm a professor at UCLA in the Department of Medicine and an investigator at the Lundquist Institute, which is on the Harvey UCLA campus. Um, I always always include a little bit about our team. We've got uh, four professors in our team, a bunch of physiologists, nurses, study coordinators, PhD students, and uh, and graduate students, research assistants. And here we are in our in our building. And what do we do? We're um, we're dedicated to research, uh, to improving the lives uh, of patients with chronic breathing difficulties. Uh, we do a lot of exercise research. One of the, somebody's uh, microphone is still on, keeps popping in. Don't know who it is. Um, we do a lot of uh, exercise research, um, but we do other things too. Um, we've authored many, many papers and are responsible for uh, a lot of developments in uh, particularly looking uh, uh, for exercise testing and um, developments in using things like anabolic steroids, uh, bronchodilators, oxygen, and cardiovascular med medications to improve uh, health. Um, we, we did some of the original work on exercise training. Those my predecessors, Dr. Kasaburi and others, um, and physical activity and, and how that relates to, uh, to health, in, uh, particularly in patients with pulmonary disease. And where are we? We're, um, Here's the Harbour UCLA Medical Center at the intersection of the 405 and the 110. And um, uh, we're on the same campus there that's on Carson Street in Normandy. Um, our lovely, be beautiful building. I used to say new building. I guess it's not that new anymore, but it is uh, uh, here on the map. And there's lots of um, parking if you wanna come and uh, participate in any of our research studies, we can park you right outside the building. So, with that brief introduction, let's talk about some uh, new research findings. And I'm gonna focus uh, today on the research that we've been doing because many of you or people that you know will probably have volunteered in some of this research. And I wanted to update you on some new findings that we've, we've made. So uh, let me see if I can just, <coughs> there we go, get rid of that. So, um, what do you what what does a what does a pulmonary researcher do when uh, when uh, research is closed down because of COVID? So we go to our database and we do a huge, great, big study on uh, ten thousand people um, from data in our database. So this was just published in a fairly important journal. Um, we did an, an analysis uh, using the chest CT scan. Many of you will have had a chest CT scan. You've been inside a CT scanner to look at your lungs. But in that scan, of course, we get images of other parts of you know, the body. We get images of the heart, we get images of the blood vessels, and we get images of the muscles. So here, I've colored them here. You can see the pectoralis muscle uh, in your chest. Uh, in, uh, and we can calculate the area of those muscles and see how they change over time or across events. So this study, we estimated the change in pectoralis, pectoral muscle area, how much muscle mass from the chest was lost during an exacerbation. Uh, and we showed roughly across two different large studies. This study has about 10,000 people in it, and this study has about 3,000 people in it. Um, across two large studies, roughly one to three percent muscle area is lost for uh, per exacerbation. And that's slightly different between males and females, and slightly different depending on your uh, severity of lung. Disease. Harry, uh, if you would unmute yourself, uh, I just muted everybody, but I need you to unmute yourself. Yes, there we go. I've just managed it. <laughs> Let me see, let me see, where was I? Here we go, yes. So um, muscle mass is lost during a hospitalization, during an exacerbation. Um, why, why is this important? Well, in the same set of data, we were able to establish that losing muscle mass 
is associated with the risk of dying. And, and I want to really uh, focus you the fact that most people, when you go to the doctor, they, may, they might measure your weight. Um, and most people are familiar with the, the BMI, body mass index. This is your, uh, how normal your weight is for someone of your height and sex. Um, and you'll see in these two large studies, COPD gene and Eclipse, that BMI is normally distributed. In other words, this is the 50th percentile, this red line here. COPD patients have a relatively normal distribution of BMI. Uh, and here in the Eclipse study, that is true also. But when we look at the fat-free mass index, so just looking at how much muscle these patients have, you'll see that they're biased towards being under-muscled, having low muscle mass. There's more people below the average, and same in this study. So just measuring your weight and knowing your BMI doesn't tell you about how much muscle mass you have. Uh, we, can, we can measure that you know, by measuring your strength or we can measure it on the chest CT scan as we did. And if we measure it on the chest CT scan and we analyze people who lost muscle area, we find compared to those that did not, we find that losing muscle area increases your risk of, of death. So this is, this is following people over about 10 years, and you can see that people who didn't lose any muscle mass uh, uh, had about a 5% risk of dying, but people that did lose muscle mass had about an 8 or 9% risk of dying. Um, and our, I think uh, panel B um, depicts those with who already had below average muscle mass to begin with. So the risks of, of mortality go up for those who have lost muscle mass already when they start when the study started. So um, being well muscled and having uh, and losing muscle is a risk factor. Um, so what can we do about this? Well, so here's some data from a study that I talked to you about two years ago. We recruited um, uh, about 10 people from the local area into this study. There are about 100 people in total in, uh, in the UK and in the US included in this study. And this study is um, a study of a drug called a selective androgen receptor modulator, or a SARM for short, S-A-R-M. What is that? It put, it, put it much more simply, it's, um, it's like testosterone, but without the uh, side effects of, of having androgenization, becoming, having virilization. So um, it doesn't uh, cause people to grow beards. It, it doesn't cause um, hyperplasia of the prostate, which is a risk factor for testosterone. Um, the SARM only acts on bone and muscle. So it can, it's, it's selective. That's what the selective means. It's selective for bone and muscle and it causes bone and muscle to grow. So we enrolled uh, in this study, a total of 100 people um, who had muscle weakness to begin with. And we tested that by the, um, the chair raises. Uh, you've, you've done this test where you get out of a chair five times. So people who had, were, had lower than normal ability to get in and out of a chair five times were uh, included in this study. Um, uh, they, were with, they, had, they had COPD and they were randomized uh, uh, to um, either take drug or placebo uh, for 90 days. And we tested them before and afterwards. Um, during the whole study, everybody in the study had a home exercise program. So you guys are doing home exercise right now um, with, your, with your yoga and, the, and on Zoom and things like that. So we gave the individuals a home exercise program. It was deli delivered through an app on uh, their uh, on a cell phone, um, and they had to do some strength training. So with like with rubber bands and lifting, uh, you know, cans of soup, things like that. They had to do strength training th uh, three times a week throughout this study, and they either took the drug or the placebo for that period of time. And here's the results. Uh, I should stress that these data are still under review. They haven't been finished in peer review yet, um, but I'm giving you a sneak preview. 
So this SOM treatment increased lean muscle mass and muscle strength in COPD patients. Uh, the effect was slightly greater in males than it was in females. Um, but you can see here the top graph is one uh, RM is the is the leg strength um, uh, of the individuals, how much weight you could push with your legs. And here's the baseline, and here's the end of the study. And you can see that there was a big increase in leg strength in the female group. Um, remember that everyone got a home exercise training program. So in the females, actually taking the drug didn't significantly increase strength over the just doing the home exercise program alone. In males, this difference was actually significant. Um, in both groups, they put on about 3% to 4% a lean body mass. So muscle and bone was increased uh, and fat was decreased compared to people in the placebo in both the males and the females. And you remember that one exacerbation is about one to 3% loss of muscle mass so here we are, here's a drug that prevents or replaces that one to 3% of muscle mass. Uh, uh, so we think this is you know, potentially important. This is a small trial in a phase two trial. Uh, we hope that the company will take this on further. We'll, we'll have to wait and see what happens. Um, and probably the most important uh, study that's come out in the past 12 months in this area um, is this study by um, uh, Lindenauer et al. It was published in, the, in JAMA, which is a very high up, very important journal, a bit like the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, they analyzed uh, data from the Medicare database, everyone in the country uh, who is eligible for Medicare. And they looked at one year mortality after the initiation of a pulmonary rehabilitation program. So, some of the subjects who had an exacerbation went to hospital and within 90 days of that hospitalization, they were in a program and doing pulmonary rehab. Others either didn't get any pulmonary rehab or started their pulmonary rehab after 90 days. And you can see that the risk of dying over the following year is halved in those that did the pulmonary rehab. So pulmonary rehabilitation, lowers the risk of mortality at one year. Such an important finding. We've never demonstrated that before in this area. We've thought that it was true, but these data are the first that really show that it's true. And um, several societies have come together to put together this infographic. Um, you can actually log on to our website, the PERF website, and download this infographic and share it amongst uh, your uh, friends and, and, and other people that you may know. Uh, we really want to stress how important pulmonary rehabilitation is. And we know that pulmonary rehabilitation is difficult right now, but getting that attention, getting that exercise training, getting the support that you need after a uh, exacerbation actually saves lives. So please uh, log on to our website, perfsecondwind.org. Uh, and you can go and find this newsletter this, and download the, the uh, infographic and the newsletter. This is all the foundations that have signed onto this, uh, this uh, newsletter to try and raise awareness for um, the use of pulmonary rehabilitation and the treatment of, of COPD. So that's some of the new uh, research that we've done and others have done. Let me change track a little bit and talk about um, some studies that are coming up. So I mentioned to you uh, at my last, uh, last time I spoke with you about um, we'd, we're developing some studies using wearable biosensors. So I think I showed you uh, this, uh, some of these images, my collaborator at uh, Caltech, and this was uh, just before lockdown when I was when we were allowed to go and visit when I went up to Caltech to their amazing campus up there. Um, so we're developing a uh, a, a, band, a wristband uh, that could be worn or, worn on the wrist like a watch that actually has chemical sensors on it and can um, tell when the well the idea is that the, we will be able to tell when um, a patient is at risk of a pulmonary exacerbation of COPD. It will give them a, an alarm to say that you need to go to the doctor now before it gets too bad. 
Um, this study uh, was funded. It was originally going to start early this year, but okay, we've delayed a bit, but I'm gonna to come to you soon and ask for uh, volunteers to come and um, uh, be part of this study where we're, um, you have to do a bit of exercise, you have to wear the wristband and, um, uh, and we uh, will measure uh, to see whether we can see um, uh, these uh, biomarkers, these uh, chemicals in the sweat uh, that uh, will indicate whether a, a, an exacerbation is uh, likely. I think I also mentioned to you that we, uh, because because we're working on these biosensors and because detecting COVID is a really important thing, we very rapidly turned our, turned our attention to changing these biosensors into COVID detectors. And we developed this uh, m uh, platform that we called the RapidPlex, SARS-CoV-2 RapidPlex. It's a plex because it, it, it's called a multiplex assay. It measures multiple things. Uh, and you can use, use it for with blood or saliva. And it, will, it measures the, um, uh, the virus uh, spike protein. So it determines whether you've got the virus or not. It measures uh, IgM and IgG, which are your antibodies that, that, are, that, that are developed after you catch the virus to fight the virus. And it measures uh, CRP, which is an inflammatory marker to show, to estimate how sensitive, how severe the infection, the, the, the uh, SARS infection is. So I'm happy to say that our preliminary data using saliva in um, patients that were either positive or negative, we can show that the um, antibodies, we can see differences in antibodies. These are the positive subjects, these are the negative. Uh, this is IgM, IgG antibodies. This is the uh, spike protein of the SARS virus itself that we can measure in saliva. And this is CRP, C-reactive protein measure of inflammation. Uh, the more CRP you have, the more severe your infection. I'm glad to say that we, we were funded for that project and that's underway um, in the hospital to change this uh, uh, concept into something that's actually usable by everybody. Um, you can just uh, spit on the sensor in the morning, it will Bluetooth to your mobile phone and tell you whether any of these things are raised. Um, the benefit of these types of sensors is, I think you're probably aware that um, uh, if, you go, if you go and have a swab, uh, that's called a PCR test, um, that takes a lot of time, it's not very convenient, it needs expensive machinery. If you, if, another option is a point of care test called a lateral flow test they're selling for about $70 each right now. So this is a computer chip. It takes uh, fractions of pennies to make. So it a, it's a, could be a big advance and everyone could have them at home and just uh, use them uh, on a daily basis very cheaply. So um, that's two of the uh, biosensors that we're currently working on. Um, a collaborator of mine uh, a couple of years ago um, developed something called the asthmagram that he that he had um, given to children. This is a this this little device uh, clips onto uh, sensors on on the respiratory muscles around the neck, um, and it has a microphone in it, and so it can tell when a child is wheezing, and it has uh, uh, electrical monitors of the muscle, so it can tell when the child is straining to breathe. And it can um, record that information um, and the cough and the wheeze and the muscle activity and sends it to the phone and they can analyze what it is that the child was doing or what they were exposed to, for example, um, air quality issues or were they in a home with a pet or something like that. Um, and they can see what, 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 how those symptoms correlate with uh, with, uh, with, with, with what the subject was actually doing. So during COVID, it's become very obvious that we um, have to uh, send uh, adults, uh, many adults coming to the hospital, they're testing positive, but they're not so severe that they need to be admitted to hospital. So they send them home. But some of those adults then become um, respiratory compromised and then they have to get admitted to hospital and some others don't. They just recover at home and they're fine. 
And there's been a huge effort in trying to maintain what they call hospital at home, uh, help these individuals monitor themselves. You know, nurses have, and 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 other people have been calling up uh, several times a day, making measurements of pulse oximetry, talking about symptoms. Uh, and so we we thought my collaborator uh, who developed this, a company called um, Neo Neovative. And uh, the collaborator is Rui Kang Chang. He's a pediatric cardiologist at Harbour UCLA. Came up with the idea of changing the aspergram into a respirogram for home respiratory monitoring. And this, this is a mock-up of what it's gonna look like. It will sit on the chest here, right above the sternal notch. Um, and it continuously records breathing sounds, heart rate, temperature, saturation, and movement um, sends it to your phone, which can be sent via a secure 5G network to a hospital computer. And the hospital computer actually analyzes that data continuously all the time and alarms go off if something bad happens. So the idea is that the um, respirogram will be worn, like I said, right, right here on the, on the suprasternal notch. Um, it has an acoustic sensor so we can hear the breathing. It has an accelerometer and a gyroscope so we can tell if the subject's moving or if maybe they've fallen down or maybe they're just asleep. Um, we it can measure your temperature. Impedance is uh, a way we can measure the chest expanding and relaxing. So um, if we don't hear any breath sounds, we can see whether their chest is actually moving or not. Um, it's got a pulse oximeter in it. Uh, it measures your heart activity. Um, and then, uh, like I said, streams in real time. The battery lasts about 24 hours and then you just swap out the battery every 24 hours um, for home respiratory monitoring. So we've submitted this grant for funding. Uh, we hope to start early next year if the NIH give us some money. Um, it'd be a very easy study to be a volunteer for because all you have to do is 48 hours of wearing a sticker here and see whether it works. Um, so we hope that uh, you might be in, uh, people might be interested in volunteering to help uh, develop this uh, home respiratory monitor that could be very useful for um, monitoring patients at home. Uh, the other uh, study that's coming up that we are he heavily involved with right now is the study of uh, this is the official term post acute sequela of COVID. I, Maybe you've heard this on the news, PASC for short. What, what does it mean? It means long COVID. It means long haulers. Um, where we've submitted a large grant um, to be part of a consortium to study this uh, effect, characterize what is long haul COVID, who gets it, why they get it, how long they have it for, all those sorts of things. And um, I've just put an additional piece of information in, in my slide set this morning, I stuck this in at 10 o'clock this morning, this came out just now um, from the British Journal of Sports Medicine. Because you guys are so active and uh, involved in exercise, I thought you might be interested to know about um, the risk of hospital, the risk factors for hospitalization in patients with COVID. Um, and so following uh, Risk, the following factors are increase the risk of hospitalization. So I often show, or maybe you've seen others show um, slides, the graphs that look like this. So how do you read a graph like this? So this, this dotted line down the middle means that the risk, is, the variable here, so this is age less than 60 years. If there was a dot on there, that would be, there was no additional risk. If it's on this, this side, it means that the risk is lower. And if it's on this side, it means the risk is higher. So what are the main risk factors for hospitalization in COVID? Well, we know older age is a big risk factor. If you're over 80 years old, it increases your risk of being hospitalized by six fold. Um, we know that male sex is actually a fairly big risk factor. I should, I should say this, these data are in 50,000 people from Kaiser Kaiser's database, Kaiser Permanente's database, and were put together um, by USC uh, scientists um, from, from a Kaiser database. 
So males have a slightly higher risk of being hospitalized with COVID um, to various degrees, uh, non-white race, most races other than white have an increased risk. Um, being overweight, particularly a BMI of, of over 40 increases your risk. If you, if you have a transplant, that increases your risk because you're immunosuppressed. If you're pregnant, that increases your risk because the doctors are scared and they want to hospitalize you. <laughs> um, if you have poor glucose control, if you have bad and out of control diabetes, that increases your risk. And what about the, the last one down here at the bottom, physical activity. Being physically inactive increases your risk two to threefold of being hospitalized for COVID if you catch COVID. So we know being physically active is good for you. We know pulmonary rehab is good for you. So I'm just trying to encourage people to maintain their activity during these times when we're all so isolated and locked down. Um, physical activity is actually a risk factor for getting uh, hospitalized from catching COVID. So how about this uh, long haul syndrome, this PASC syndrome? So this uh, study was done to count symptoms over time from when people were first diagnosed with COVID to six or seven months later. And they, they noticed that there's, there's two, two groups. There's a group that sort of recover and have no symptoms after about three months. And there's a group that still has many, many symptoms after seven months. And look at the numbers in this. 90%, 95% of people still have 14 symptoms after seven months after they've been diagnosed with COVID. It's really, really um, dramatic. Now this, is, this study may be biased because people who have long COVID are more likely to respond to these questionnaires, but um, we're expecting at least 30% of the people that had COVID to suffer in some way from some element of long COVID. And what are these symptoms that they're getting? So I've highlighted here the two biggest symptoms. Um, this is time here, and this is uh, the probability of having a symptom. So this shows you that 80% of the people who still had symptoms at night, seven months reported having fatigue and post-exertional malaise. So you know, 70 to 80% of people are still experiencing that. What about pulmonary and respiratory symptoms? Well, the top two are shortness of breath and breathing difficulties. I'm sure you guys can relate. Um, there, people are reporting dizziness and balance issue as well as all the neurological sensations below like smell, um, tremors, vibrating sensations. Um, they're report reporting joint pain and muscle aches about 40% of people and about 60% of people are saying memory issues and brain fog are part of their symptom profile. So this, this is not gonna be a, um, uh, an easy thing to, to identify. There's a lot going on here, a lot of different uh, etiologies of um, post-acute COVID syndrome. Um, and it's not just, uh, It's not just uh, the sensations uh, like neuro neuropsychiatric -psychi sensations like um, the loss of smell. I mean, it's really serious pathological changes. So this is a 64 year old. This is a chest CT scan of a, of a, of a sorry, it's a chest X-ray of a 64 year old who had um, fibrosis in their lung two months after COVID. You can see all this scarring down here, all this white right? That's two months after COVID. Well, six months later, it, it's worse. It hasn't got any better. It's scarring has progressed. Um, and especially at the bases here, there's some very abnormal, bigger abnormalities. So there's going to be patients here that, you know, we've had uh, millions of patients with COVID in the US. And some of these things are going to be persistent over a long period of time. And we need to get on, onto this early. So we've built a uh, we're part of a network. Um, it's actually run by um, National Jewish in Denver. It's the same group that ran the COPD gene study. We very quickly put together a network of all these medical centers around the US uh, and some in Canada as well. There's uh, 30 in total. 
uh, and we have uh, nearly 100,000 um, post-acute COVID patients in uh, all of these hospitals. Um, we've put in a big grant to the NIH that we hope will be funded. And if it is, what's, we're going to enroll people to the most comprehensive physical assessment, uh, clinical assessment you've ever seen. So they'll have a lot of history and physical exams. They'll uh, do a lot of questionnaires about their symptoms, their fatigue, their anxiety, their depression. Um, they'll do lung function tests, diffusion tests. Um, we'll look at their sleep uh, uh, habits. We'll do neurological exams. Um, we'll do brain MRI. We're, we're going to do a shuttle walking test, um, a cardiopulmonary exercise test, hand grip strength, body composition. Um, we will use the CT to look at muscle mass, like we said before. We're going to do physical activity monitoring to see how they move around. We're going to look at their electrocardiogram, their heart activity. We're going to use a CT and MRI scans to look at heart scarring because that's another big um, concern about fibrosis in the heart. Um, and people will wear an arrhythmia monitor to look at arrhythmias, which uh, fibrosis can cause arrhythmias. Um, so this uh, study was put together with lightning speed. I think last time I talked to you, I talked to you about how quickly the vaccine trials had been developed and put together and look where we are a year later. We've nearly everybody's hand went up or maybe everybody's did. And we said we'd all had the vaccine. So th th this, uh, this post-acute COVID is of a similar urgency. So NIH announced on the 25th of February that they are going to put $1 billion of research funding into this area. Um, the deadline for the grant submission was the 22nd of March. So we had to build our network of 30 sites, develop this protocol and submit the grant in less than a month, which is unheard of. Uh, we've never worked so hard in all our lives, I can tell you. <laughs> Um, the NIH are uh, giving, us, giving themselves a month to review all the applications and choose the winners. And then the next day, the first meeting of the planning committee will start. We'll develop the protocol over a month and the NIH say they want the study approved by all the regulations um, to go ahead by it within, within the month by 30th of May. So we can start recruiting first patient in on June the 1st and the 5,000th patient enrolled a year later. We're going to re recruit 5,000 people with post-acute COVID and follow them for up to four years to see what happens in these individuals. Um, some will get better quickly, as I said, and some will, will roll on uh, slowly. And um, hopefully we can identify what it is that is wrong with them and then come up and develop treatments. Um, so, you know, we should start, hopefully start be seeing treatments for um, post-acute COVID um, by uh, the middle of next year. Uh, as you know, pulmonary rehab is one of the prime candidates for treatment of these patients. Um, you guys have all been through pulmonary rehab. You know the benefits of it for patients with breathing difficulties, and these patients may be very similar. So um, we're expecting pulmonary rehab to, to play a big role in, uh, in treating these, uh, these individuals. Uh, just the last couple of minutes, um, I'll tell you about some other pulmonary trials that we're doing right now. Um, we've got a trial, a uh, COVID trial using antithrombotics, so anti-blood uh, drugs that prevent blood clots. You, you've probably heard that blood clots are a big side effect of um, COVID, and we see a lot, a lot of this in the hospital. So we're doing a, a study of, of, of giving uh, blood thinners uh, prophylactically um, at, at the, at when people are admitted to try and reduce the number of blood clots they're getting uh, if they're hospitalized for COVID. Uh, we've got a novel, um, this is actually an old uh, drug that's being repurposed, um, but we think it's gonna be very useful for um, outpatients who don't have very severe COVID, but they will help their recovery. The, the preliminary data suggests it reduces recovery times by uh, uh, maybe five days. And we've got two bronchoscopy studies underway. Um, they're both kind of similar, but they're tr treating slightly different phenotypes. One's called Airflow 3 and one's called REOX. Um, this Airflow 3 is lung targeted denervation. I talked to you about this before. It's a bronchoscopy 
we go down into the airway, we zap the lung, um, and it uh, reduces um, the, uh, it allows the, the lung to uh, bronchodilate. So it essentially does the same thing that a bronchodilator drug does, like albuterol, but it um, is permanent. Uh, and that has been shown to reduce exacerbations in small clinical trials. And so they're doing this large clinical trial to see whether that is true. Um, REOX is, uses a very similar approach. It's a bronchoscopy um, uh, with, a, with an electric zapper that goes down into the airway. But this one is, is uh, aiming to reduce chronic bronchitis. It reduces mucus production. So it zaps the cells that produce mucus. So people who have chronic bronchitis and lots of mucus production, this one is hoped to reduce that. Um, we're doing a new study on uh, COPD cachexia, so patients who lose a lot of muscle mass and are wasting. Um, we're trying to investigate, um, there's a strong relationship with iron metabolism uh, and um, breakdown of blood products. So we're investigating that in a, a study with uh, the University of Alabama in Birmingham. Um, and we've got a study ongoing when we can restart pulmonary rehab, um, where we're looking at how pulmonary rehabilitation um, might release anti-inflammatory factors into the bloodstream. So uh, this, this one is like is on hold right now, but we hope to restart it very soon. Uh, and of course, we've got many, many more that I'm not going to bore you with. So if you're interested in, in, in getting involved, the best way to do it is to join our patient registry. Um, we uh, accept all comers, uh, we pay you $35, um, and we ask for, for review of your medical history and the medications that you take. You, we get asked you to answer some short questionnaires about your breathing, you get a spirometry test, um, and then we identify from your characteristics any studies for which you might be eligible to join. Uh, of course, you don't have to join them if you're not interested, but um, we'll keep your information. And if there's another study for which you, you're eligible, we will give you a call. So if you're interested in joining our registry, you're welcome to do that. And uh, here's the number, I'll put it up at the end, um, but it's our usual number, 310-222-8200. Um, give us a call and you can join our registry. If that sounds a little bit too much, please make use of our um, the Pulmonary Education Research Foundation website at perfsecondwind.org. We have a lot of information about pulmonary disease and we publish a regular blog that you can sign up for and get an email about uh, a, a new blog post. We do blog posts about every two weeks um, if, I'm, if I'm on top of things <laughs> um, and, and uh, give you information about current uh, treatments and what's going on in the pulmonary world. Um, so please uh, feel free, that's all free. Um, it's no cost to anyone. This is supported by the foundation. So please uh, make use of that. And um, thank you very much. R really enjoyed speaking to you. Thank you, Dr. Rossiter. Uh, you're just, uh, you presented such interesting information and, and some of the, the studies you guys are involved with are, are just fascinating. And we're so lucky to, to be so close to you and to, to hear about all your studies. I think some of these studies with the electronic armband and so forth is, is just, it's so cool. There's such exciting times going on right now and you guys are at the leading edge and we're so lucky to have you speak to us today. And I know all of us at PEP greatly appreciate your presence here. So get, please give Harry a nice round of applause. Thank we, you, Harry. And, and, and we appreciate you. None of this, none of this research could happen without your involvement. So, you know, you guys are, are the engine that makes this work. It's a mutual relationship here. Well, thank you. And I got to plug, uh, you know, registering with their registry because uh, I've done a number of clinical trials there and it's a great experience. You're really helping out people with COPD and you're helping yourself. And, and I immensely enjoyed participating in the clinical trials. So if you haven't registered with these guys, please do. It's a great deal and it's all confidential and I think you'd enjoy it. So we have a, a little time for Q&A. So uh, please, uh, I'm gonna stop recording.